Amigian was a really um, sparkling and intelligent and um, artistic and creative person who was just beginning to figure out what she wanted to do in life, um, just as I was at that age. And she, even though she and I were only five years apart, um, she was five years older, uh, we were like twins. I mean, we could read each other's minds and finish each other's sentences. It was just so unfathomable. Um, it was not even, it, it, it's not even something, that, um, it's not even the worst thing your imagination can come up with, really. And so it was a huge shock. Of course, today, because it, there are just so many mass shootings, it's become normalized. I know that there are a lot of support groups. There are, I think there's even some federal law that helps schools rebuild after a mass shooting. I mean, that's how um, much it's come a part of our routine, um, our daily, of our late daily lives. But back then, yeah, it was, it was as if an atomic bomb had detonated in our living room. That's really what it felt like. And for years afterward, you know, we just spent our lives just wandering around in this nuclear winter. That's what it felt like. <laughs> the truth is these mass shootings are so frequent, even if they do say who they are, people are gonna forget. There's just this, you know, flurry of horrific incidents and you lose track of who did what to whom and how many people were killed at this point. But what do we need to remember if we do forget their names? What's so important that we do remember and why tell this story 30 years later? That it's important to know that these people, these statistics um, in these body counts were, were once real human beings who had dreams, who had family, who had loved ones, and that it's not just the loss of one person, it's just the loss of a whole, li a whole other life we could have had. And that's something I will always mourn in addition to the loss of my sister. You know, our mother passed away uh, just this past March. And um, my mother passed away under vastly different circumstances. She was in her 80s. And we believe she, she passed away from natural causes. Um, but of course, I think about how, how great it would be to have my oldest sister around supporting my family. But now um, it's for the most part, it's just me as a primary caregiver. Um, and so this is how a mass shooting um, reverberates over time. You know, there's, it's, it really never ends um, for uh, family members of the victims. In your opinion, is it about guns? I mean, here we are 30 years later and it could happen, you know, it happens every day. Have we accomplished anything in your mind? Is it about mental health? It, you know, what, what do you focus on every time you hear of another mass shooting? Well, I'm an elementary school teacher, and uh, like most elementary school teachers across America, we have to do these active shooter drills. And during those drills, uh, for my students, it's kind of like a game. I mean, I could hear them giggling and whispering as they huddle in a corner. But for me, you know, as I sit there in the dark waiting for the, um, I guess the uh, alert, the drill to be lifted, I'm j I just sit there thinking about, you know, how, th how it's the, this is the outcome of a monumental failure on um, the part of lawmakers and the general public to come together and um, agree on a way to stop this from happening over and over and over again. And I, I feel numb to what's going on. I think that's almost the only way you can deal with it as an American. Um, it's become such a political um, football. Uh, and meanwhile, people are still dying. People are still being gunned down. And it's only metastasized into something um, much worse. So I almost feel like the, the only way you can really deal with it is to um, you know just put your blinders on, step outside your home, put one foot in front of the other, and just try moving forward with your life. 
because I personally, as one person, don't feel, and it's very sad to say, that I can really make much of a difference, quite honestly. I know Carolyn McCarthy went all the way to Congress, and I think she probably feels the same way. So you kind of feel it's unsolvable. I think that if you want to avoid the kind of violence we're seeing here, you have to move to Canada or Japan, where the cultures, the laws, um, are all in sync with um, protecting people from gun violence. Uh, I think every country has people who are mentally unstable, but they don't have access to AR-15s or um, just the endless supply of weapons out there. I mean, there, there are more weapons uh, and guns out there than there are people in the United States. So that, is, that does not give me reason to hope, quite, quite frankly. With hundreds, if not thousands, of mass shootings that have taken place since then, it is absolutely in danger of being forgotten forever. So I think whatever I can do to help keep my sister's memory alive, the memory of that day alive, I, I, I hope will um, just remind people to um, think about the victims of these shootings and how they're not anonymous faces or names. They are real people who lived and loved and um, were surrounded by family members and friends who li um, lived and loved them as well. And we're just going about their lives completely randomly, yeah. lives ended. Yeah, and, and it's nowadays you, you can't go to a shopping mall or a church or to school. Um, you can't go about the rhythms of your daily life without it somehow being in the back of your head. And, um, you know, you, I know people who are, who've told me that when they go, they're fearful of public spaces and um, they kind of scope out where the exits are when they enter a store or something. Um, and it's really horrible that we have to think that way. But that's the reality of life in America now.